Today, we are very fortunate having uh, Michael Slocum join us. He is the senior member of the law firm Slocum & Bodie, specializing in contract law, legal issues related to clinical applied and basic research, corporate issues, intellectual property, and executive estate planning. He has more than 40 years of experience and has represented hospital systems, hundreds of businesses, both in the U.S. and in foreign countries, uh, universities, nonprofit organizations, and even agencies of the federal government. Uh, Mr. Slocum negotiates clinical trials and other research contract uh, terms with drug companies and other entities on a daily basis. Uh, Mr. Slocum uh, began, pre began private practice with his own law firm in 1980. Uh, he is an honor graduate of uh, DePaul, DePaul <laughs> University and received his JD with honors from George Washington University National Law Center. He is a member of the Virginia State Law Bar. He is a distinguished faculty member of the Society of Research Administrators and an adjunct professor in graduate school of nursing at Uniform Services University of Health Sciences. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Slocum. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, uh, and with, we can go to the second slide. Thank you. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today is just a selected number of clauses uh, that uh, need to be negotiated pretty routinely in clinical trials. Uh, as Jeff mentioned, I've been dealing with clinical trials uh, on a almost daily basis. I, I actually uh, marked up one this morning and marked up an expanded use agreement as well uh, and uh, did another one yesterday and one the day before. So it's been a busy week so far. Um, uh, but I've been doing that for many years. And uh, as I was told when I first started in this process and took my first training program about 35 years ago, there are basically seven or eight issues that come up in just about every single clinical trial. The, uh, the uh, same issues have been, were, were identified in literally in 1987 or eight when I took that first training program and are still in every uh, clinical trial agreement. Um, now, let me limit what I'm talking about first. I'm talking about first clinical trials. So these are experiments related to patients. Uh, you can expand that a little bit, cite some psychology or uh, uh, may, maybe educational programs might also involve things that are essentially clinical trials, normally medical in one way or another. Uh, and uh, we are looking at those experiments to find an appropriate treatment for future patients. Uh, and then in this particular case, we're going to be talking about sponsor initiated, for the most part, uh, commercial sponsors, that is drug companies, device companies, and so forth, uh, will not deal much with NIH or other government agencies, they, although they are sometimes the sponsor and will not deal uh, with the uh, most investigator initiated clinical trials. So the next uh, slide, next slide, please. Okay, so normally we are talking about an FDA governed process. The, uh, the FDA is the be all and end all for this process. And normally we're talking about not phase one, which is usually a pure safety trial. Very few safety trials are done uh, with outside institutions. Most of the time, the drug companies are going to be doing these internally. Uh, by the way, if you hear clocks going off, uh, I'm in a room literally with, uh, I can see four or five grandfather clocks. So there's, there's just a lot of them here. Um, and they're, of course, none of them are exactly the same time. Um, okay, so we will be dealing in many cases with a phase two or a phase two, phase three trial. Those trials are dealing with safety and then with effectiveness and then with dosage. Uh, those trials are, are routinely contracted to institutions that have the patient base. Next trial, uh, next slide. Okay. We're also not going to deal with every clause in a clinical trial contract. Uh, every clinical trial contract has uh, pretty much all the clauses you would expect in any kind of contract. So we're, you've got an assignment clause and you've got a force majeure clause and you've got all kinds of other clauses. 
Uh, but we've only got one hour to deal with the, with what we're talking about today. So I've selected some clauses that I found you need to make sure you deal with every time you are dealing with a uh, clinical trial and that present the same kind of issues again and again and again and again. All of the drug companies and device companies or many of them treat these issues in a certain way in almost every site or institution needs to change them in basically the same way. Uh, and so uh, if we all get together and start telling drug companies and device companies the same thing in terms of what language we'd like to see, maybe we can, again, reduce the amount of uh, back and forth that we have to do with these by getting some language standardized. When I started in the process, there were several uh, other areas. For example, the idea of paying for uncancelable obligations uh, when there's been a termination. Uh, and I had to add that in all the time. Now then, most of the time, I'm finding it's already there when I start negotiations. Now, I, not all the time. I just had to add it in literally this morning. But most of the time, some of the things that, uh, that we've been pushing for as sites and institutions um, for the last 30 years are beginning to be uh, accepted without us having to put them in every single time. Um, by the way, uh, I don't represent drug companies. I don't represent device companies. I am always on the uh, institutional side. Okay, the, the areas that I wanna talk about today are parties. And this is particularly because for some reason, I am seeing um, particularly CROs, that is clinical research organizations, the intermediaries with the drug companies, uh, their standard forms, they, are, they have started using three-party agreements uh, in cases where the PI, the, the principal investigator, is a, an employee of the institution and a third party, uh, a three-party agreement is simply inappropriate. Uh, records issues. There are some reasonably subtle issues that need to be dealt with uh, when you start dealing with the various re records that are involved in a clinical trial. We'll come to each of these and, and talk about them in more detail. Confidentiality. Uh, the, the whole, in almost every other area of contracting that I deal with, confidentiality is routinely dealt with on a mutual basis. Uh, in clinical trials, uh, there's apparently an assumption that, uh, that uh, the institution has no confidential information. And that's just not true. We'll talk about that. Publication, the big issue here to be addressed. And again, when I started uh, negotiating clinical trials, I would often find language that basically said that the drug company you know, had, con had control of publication, which is simply not acceptable. Uh, that's, for the most part, again, uh, gone by the wayside, and the companies uh, accept that you have to have publication rights. However, the multi-center language, even that language as used in the ACTA, which is the, the uh, accelerated clinical trial agreement, that's a model agreement, um, that language is not really completely acceptable. And there is a, there is a solution there, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the subject injury and indemnification clauses are something that are negotiated routinely. There are several Again, somewhat uh, subtle uh, issues that need to be dealt with routinely there. And then disputes in state law. And now I know uh, many of you may be uh, uh, representing a state institution and others may represent uh, international institutions or you may be dealing with international clinical trials. We'll talk about some things there. So next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, start at the very beginning on your clinical trial. Take a look, who are the parties? Uh, the first issue you need to address, and, and again, I don't know why it has seemed to have 
jumped back into being an issue. This was something that we saw many years ago. We would see these three party agreements where the investigator was made a party. Uh, there is not a state in the union where an employed investigator should be a party to a clinical trial agreement with your institution. Uh, that employee, just like you, uh, should not be an independent contracting party in your agreement. Uh, that uh, investigator, if they're an employee, needs to be just that, an employee. You, the, there's plenty, plenty of templates that you can go to for two-party agreements. Uh, and uh, so the first thing you want to look for is, are they making the investigator responsible as an independent actor? If so, the only area that that's appropriate is in the, the PI is legitimately an independent actor for purposes of the 1572, the FDA form signed by the principal investigator. That's an appropriate thing. And the things that the PI agrees to do as a PI under the 1572, that works. Uh, however, many CROs, and I've had this with uh, four or five recently, and they will tell you they don't even have a two-party agreement. And which I find amazing, but uh, what you need to do in those cases is just strip that PI back out. Uh, if, if you are a university or a hospital system and your PI is an employee, then even if you were to agree that that PI should be a, an independent contracting party under your state laws, the PI is probably able to wiggle right back out of that. Now, if I've got any drug companies or, or CROs uh, in the, in the uh, audience, uh, I would love to understand why this seems to have come back in as something that's being pushed. And again, I've not seen it by the drug companies. I've only seen this recently by CROs on behalf of the drug companies they're representing. And I'm just not sure why they're doing it. And I haven't been able to get an answer from anybody. Uh, but it is an important thing because you are, from a legal point of view, you are making a real mess of who's responsible for what when you try and bring in your own employee as an independent contracting party. Uh, there are, there are long-standing legal doctrines that say that that's just not appropriate. Uh, and, and in fact, in most cases, say that even if you agree to that, it's not enforceable. So it's not something that you want to look at. Now, the second thing you need to look at is, and this is something that, uh, that one of my clients actually brought to my attention to begin with. Um, I have a question here, and it's in little tiny type. Uh, so uh, Jeff can look at that and get back to us with it. Um, all right. So let's finish this part, and we'll come to your question. All right. Uh, so the PI, for one reason or another, becomes unable to complete the study. Right. Uh, there's very, very common language then to deal with the parties get together, try and come up with a substitute PI. Uh, there may also be language about moving the study if the PI simply move, is moving to another institution. Those are all things that are reasonably straightforward. I, you still need to read them through and make sure that it works for your institution. But uh, one of the things that you need to consider often, probably 80, 90% of the time, uh, the, the, FD, and the FDA, the, the sponsor's template language will provide that the sponsor can terminate if you can't come to an agreement on who the PI should be, the, new, the substitute PI. Um, and uh, the issue, of course, is as a practical matter, if you can't come to an agreement, this contract's over. So either party needs to be able to terminate. And uh, that's something that once it's pointed out, and once you explain that, I've most of the time I've had to go into what is my rationale? My rationale is, <laughs> as a practical matter, there's no way around it. 
either party needs to be able to say enough's enough we've negotiated as long as we can we can't come up with an acceptable substitute let's terminate this contract uh, and be done uh, and so that language needs to be picked up in either the initial language about who the PI is and substituting the PI or in the termination clause or both. Uh, so next slide. We have a, a comment in the chat here about okay. uh, a PI being a party to the agreement. Um, right. We have someone here on the call that has experience working for a medical device company. And it was very common for them uh, in a European clinical trial agreement uh, to have the PI as a party to the agreement because they're often not an employee. And, and, and I am absolutely in agreement. If the employee is not, if the PI is not an employee, that is, uh, let's jump back to that slide. So those people making notes on these slides can do that. Um, if, the, if the PI is not an employee, they need to be either a, an independent contracting party, or in many cases, this is an area you're going to need to do some due diligence as the institution Many times that PI may be, uh, again, let's assume they're a doctor, right? Uh, the uh, PI doctor is probably not an independent individual contractor. They are either an employee of a corporate practice, they're an employee of some other kind of organization, or maybe they're the owner and uh, either employee or operator of something like a uh, a PC or a PLLC or an LLC or so forth. Depends on state law. That entity that they are an employee of needs to be the third party or that entity needs to release them to act as an individual contractor. In any case, if they're not an employee, I'm in absolute agreement. It needs to be a three-party agreement with someone. That someone or some entity may be either the individual doctor or, and again, it could be an, uh, an RN or a, a nurse practitioner or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or, you know, could be another health professional. But um, they that is absolutely appropriate that you have a three-party agreement when you're not talking employees. However, where you're talking employee PIs, that three-party agreement is just not appropriate. Okay, now we can advance the slide. Okay, uh, the records, there's a bunch of different places where the records are discussed in the uh, standard template clinical trial agreement. There's usually a records or equivalent clause. There are uh, sections in the confidentiality. There are uh, often definitional clauses. Um, the first thing to start with is what records are we really talking about? Now, clinical trial agreements routinely will talk about medical records. There are, there's a problem with that term. Let's start with what the definitions are that the FDA uses. They have something called the ICH, the International Conference on Harmonization, and the Consolidated Guidance for Industry. Now, this is not for us, it's for industry, but it's what we all use. Uh, and it's called, it's uh, the E6 and it's version, whatever it is, two. And it's uh, uh, the most recent one was a couple of years ago. And it's all referenced by the FDA. But they actually have a glossary of terms. And when you go to the glossary of terms and you look under medical records, it says see source document. It's not a defined term. If you go to your state law and you look in your state code of your, your code of law or regulation, you may find, as in Virginia, that there are five different definitions of what a medical record is in different places in the state code. Uh, in another state that I'm familiar with, in Nevada, there is no definition of medical records. They're called healthcare records. Uh, you get into Illinois, you get a different definition. I've ha have happened to have to look that up. So what is a medical record is something that is subject to discussion. If you go to the ICH, which the FDA says we're supposed to be using as guidance for these clinical trials, 
The document, and this was pointed out to me by a drug company lawyer, the, the documents are called source documents. Source documents is a defined term under the ICH glossary. Uh, and it's it actually, I, I do this so often, I can tell you it's 1.52. And it goes right along with the study documents, the study data. Those are defined terms. There are the, the definitions used by the FDA in their regulations and their guidance are right in that ICH. And uh, much of the law in any area is a matter of definition. So uh, I am uh, pretty adamant that I go through in clinical trials and uh, normally simply change medical record to say source document. Occasionally, because of the way the definition of source documents works, I will go with the language we use today and that I agreed to today is medical records and other source documents, because that's redundant, but at least it all picks up the fact that it's that medical records are part of the source document definition. That's important because under your state law, what are medical records may well have a definition and it is not usually as broad as the source document definition uh, and sometimes it involves things that are not source documents so we're better off staying with what the fda says are the issues that with the, the the items that we want to be in uh, this contract beyond that uh, some issues that you absolutely need to look at every single time how long do you have to keep these records? This is a very, very common issue, uh, and it varies by the, the sponsor's requirements, your requirements, and your organization's requirements. Uh, start with, if it is a Canadian clinical trial, they have a national law requiring retention of their study records, not your source documents necessarily, but their study records for 21 years. Uh, other European countries have various statutory requirements for retention of the study records. Uh, the FDA has a requirement based on the, when the, the study is over and when the drug goes to market. Uh, so you'll need to look at how long you keep what records and what happens if you are not going to be keeping those records and make sure that works for you. This is particularly important if you're not a long-standing state or uh, large institution. Uh, for example, if you're doing clinical trials in a private practice situation uh, and uh, your doc is 50 years old, then a 21-year document retention requirement maybe long after that doctor is retired and wants to be out of the business. How are you going to deal with that? So this is not something I can tell you to use particular language, but you do need to deal with your time for retention. And particularly again, uh, when the study is over and what are you gonna do with these things? Where do they go? And who's gonna pay for storage? This is a point again, particularly in private practice. Who's going to pay for that continued storage for years and years and years and years, All right? Uh, now, uh, beyond the uh, maintenance of the records uh, and, and the, the other issue will be the format and form for that maintenance. This is, this is going to be changing again as more and more records are held uh, electronically and the paper versions of these things uh, may or may not be needed to be continued. And so keep your eye on the FDA requirements for what has to be kept as a paper record. And let's take the next slide then. Next slide, there we go. Okay, uh, again, what happens if you need to transfer records? How does that happen? Who owns those records? Again, I always make a point that the institution owns its source documents. Um, now, the tricky part here is, now this is a, a, a copy, it, both you have the ownership in terms of physical possession. Well, those study documents are not gonna leave the institution. That's just not gonna happen. 
uh, unless you've actually transferred them to another institution. Uh, but who is going to have the copyright is really the question here. And uh, 50 states provide that you own the patient medical records, the source documents, use whichever term within that state law is required. Uh, you own those. You own the source documents. You need to make that plain because the, the uh, sponsors often will uh, assert that they own all of the study documents. The interesting part is those study documents are a subset of your source documents. So you will need to negotiate in some cases, uh, the, the more sophisticated sponsors will want to carve out that you own the source documents, except they own the study documents with, that are within your source documents. Uh, and, then, and that's uh, something that, again, you can negotiate the exact language that works for your uh, institution. Uh, particularly, again, if you're a state institution, you need to, to review with, uh, and I would review it with counsel because it gets pretty sophisticated in terms of who actually owns the documents of a state institution uh, under state law and, and uh, as opposed to under the FDA requirements or under general copyright law. Uh, another issue with, uh, with documents is disposition. And many, many, many sponsor template clinical trial agreements are simply out of date in this area. They use language that was perhaps appropriate back before we ever had computers. Uh, they will say that their documents, that's the documents they've provided to you, uh, which are confidential, and this is often in your confidentiality clause, it may be someplace else in the contract, but it's usually in the confidentiality clause. They'll say they have the right to tell you to destroy those records, those confidential records that they have provided you or that you've developed on their behalf, uh, other than again, the study documents, and it will say in most cases, but you can keep one copy for archival or for legal purposes. Well, that's just not the way things work in today's technology. Uh, one, almost every single document that most large institutions have are automatically backed up onto to usually nowadays the cloud someplace. Uh, and there are potentially thousands or millions of copies, electronic copies of those documents floating around in your various institutional cloud systems. Um, and uh, so the, what you need to do is come up with a standard replacement clause that deals with the fact that if one party has the right to tell the other party get rid of those confidential documents that are floating around in the, the receiving party's system, that has to not include those electronic copies that are automatically backed up. One, it's almost always uh, improper, if not illegal, to delete those electronic copies. And two, again, those of you who are in state institutions in particular, it may not be legal for you to accept that destruction on demand um, language. So, so it's, a, it's uh, what, what we lawyers call boilerplate. It's something that people read over all the time and don't pay attention to. In this case, you really do need to pay attention to what happens in terms of disposition of documents. On the other side, again, uh, we'll talk more about confidentiality, but once you make the confidentiality clause mutual, you need to think about what your rights are to tell the other party to get rid of their copies of your confidential information and what rights you don't have. All right, next, next slide. Okay, which takes us to, uh, as uh, the, the, the phrase that I think has suddenly entered our zeitgeist is that having been said, uh, <laughs> uh, the confidentiality clause in almost every clinical trial agreement that I see uh, starts out being that the institution will keep the sponsor's uh, information confidential. 
Uh, and uh, again, this is something that a, a client of mine first pointed out to me, that really needs to be mutual because there is confidential information that you're providing to the sponsor. Let's start with your pricing and your personnel information other than that information that has to be published under the what's usually called the Sunshine Act, the uh, uh, federal law that says that certain information about the PI and, and others has to be published. But beyond that, uh, personnel information about your people should not be uh, uh, open to the public. And it shouldn't be something that the, uh, that, the, that the sponsor can do anything where they want with. So you do have uh, confidential information. I've had one client who had their pricing information actually given to a competing institution, which is inappropriate. Uh, and in that case, it, we had claimed confidentiality and we're able to uh, take action against it. All right. So uh, what is that information? Again, you can start with a generalized definition of confidential information and then specify the sponsor's confidential information and the institution's information. Uh, or you can uh, you have various versions of that there's I've, I've got about six different versions that I work with uh, with uh, for profit sponsors. Uh, beyond that, you need to deal with the fact that you are you have third party information which is confidential. And again, the template clause talks about the fact that the institution has to maintain that third party information, the HIPAA information and otherwise as confidential, but it often does not actually explicitly require the sponsor to keep that same information confidential. Uh, and, and it also doesn't deal with what happens if the sponsor violates the third party rights. We'll come back to that in, over in the indemnity clause, all right? Uh, I have language that I routinely use that imports an obligation where it's not already in the, in the contract, in the template contract, an obligation on behalf of the sponsor to maintain confidentiality. Now, a lot of sponsors will tell you, oh, we, we don't see any uh, de -identify, I mean, identifiable data. We only see de-identified data, except except, oops, back over in that records clause or in an inspection and, and monitoring clause, there will be a right demanded legitimately by the sponsor to review the source documents. Those are the unredacted documents that have patient information in them. And if a sponsor, uh, agent or a CRO agent happens to look at your celebrity patient information and decide that they want to tell everybody in the world about Kim Kardashian's medical history, who's responsible? Well, you are. And so you're going to need to deal with, they're also taking responsibility for that. Number one, by saying it's improper for them to disclose anything they do come in contact with, and then two, dealing with what happens if they and you are uh, held liable by that third party, right? Uh, and then beyond that, what are the obligations of the investigative staff and again, any students for confidentiality? What obligation, this is an area that I have no problem with the, the sponsor saying that your folks have to be bound by that confidentiality that in particular uh, with your students, the question that you need to ask yourself is, how is that actually being implemented in your institution? Is the investigator signing an investigator agreement? Uh, and again, I'm talking about an employee investigator, but are you, if, if it is a non-employee, are you putting that obligation over in their uh, documents, their contract, uh, if they are not a third party? Um, contracting party. What about the rest of your staff, your nurses, your, PA, your uh, uh, physician's assistants, your uh, records folks, any of the rest of them? Is there in fact an, an, a, an enforceable obligation of confidentiality on the part of the rest of your staff? And then finally, if you've got students in, 
how are they in fact covered by those obligations for confidentiality? So this is, a, is an area that you will need to look at uh, internally and make sure that policy, procedure, and then internal agreements with those folks cover this issue. All right, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, some areas that you will, as you go through, these are just different parts of the contract that you'll be looking at this, this issue of confidentiality uh, beyond the confidentiality clause itself. Um, what rights, if any, do each party, or if there are three parties, the three parties have to the use of the other's name, images, so forth. There are uh, required and uh, permissive places where that information can be shared, but there are also limits on that. Uh, and again, when can you use the PI's name? When can you, when should you not be using the, the PI's name? Uh, are there trademark issues that you need to deal with in terms of the products uh, that are involved uh, or the results of the research uh, in particular, all right? Uh, publicity, there is usually a clause in the CTA, the clinical trial agreement, dealing with what publicity is appropriate and what cannot be said, particularly related to uh, the, the SEC and investment and discussions. Uh, there will also, also normally be where you are having uh, either ads or other recruitment documents for patients. Uh, there will be language there that you'll need to think about. Uh, what are the rules about confidentiality when you're, when you're putting that together? Uh, there are almost always, again, in that publicity clause, there's a clause related to doing press releases and what can and cannot be said. And then again, it's almost routine that there will be a limit on what you can say if there's any kind of inquiry from media and financial on that, uh, analysts. So these are all areas that's not usually in the confidentiality clause, but it deals with that issue. And you'll need to, as you go through the, the CTA, deal with that as well. Okay, next slide. Okay, publication. Um, publication is for most clinical trial agreements for the institution is one of the most important clauses because if you're not publishing, it's not research. Clinical trial agreements where publication is not uh, a right of the institution under the IRS rules, which is what we're really worried about, that's not research, and therefore, it, at a minimum, it's UBIT. Uh, if you are in a building that was paid for with tax-exempt bonds, which most state uh, institutions and most hospitals, that's going to be the case. Uh, and if you're allowing activities, clinical trial uh, agreement activities that are not classified as research by the IRS, the, the tax exempt status of that bond is uh, in danger because they're not supposed to have activities that don't qualify uh, as research act, uh, operating in that, that building. Uh, so you really do have to have the rights to publish. There are uh, very, very specific limitations on those rights that can be imposed by the sponsor. They have a right, they can impose a right to review in advance for a limited period of time. They have a right to comment and they can demand that their confidential information other than the results, which are sooner or later not going to be confidential, but are confidential up to a certain point, uh, be, uh, uh, but the other confidential information can be redacted or, or removed from the publication. Um, and then you have uh, the, the non-scientific publication issues. When and where can you discuss these results and the, and the uh, trial other than in a scientific con, uh, uh, context? Um, all right. Uh, again, 15, 20 years ago, it used to be routine that I would have to rewrite 
or even put in a publication clause. There would be uh, clinical trial agreements where it simply said the sponsor had all the rights to publication, and I'd have to strike that and put in my standard uh, publication clause for the institution. I almost never have to do that anymore. I, I had to do it once in the last six or eight months, uh, where and it was a foreign a foreign sponsor and it was a startup situation and just they, they were just newbies so to speak uh at any of the large companies and most even of the small companies and cro's that's not going to be an issue anymore it will clearly state that the institution has a right to publish subject to that review subject to the the uh, right to remove confidential information on the part of the sponsor that's not to say that you don't need to read the clause and modify those issues to make sure that it matches what you need and what your internal policies or institutional policies are. But the clause, the basic clause will be there. Um, now, I, I, it is important that you know your own institution's policies about how long those review periods should be and just how far a sponsor can go in terms of removing their confidential information uh, without either your agreement or at least without your discussion of what is in fact removable versus what is not. Okay, next slide. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, go back one slide. Let's talk about the most important thing that is often not there. Back one slide. Can we go back to the one there? Nope, nope, you're going forward. Go back to now. There we go. Okay, what's not in most publication clauses? Um, the, there is language that says, if the study is multi-center, and to tell the truth, I'm not sure if there are much of any studies anymore that are not multi-center. You just can't get enough patients in it, particularly in a phase three trial, to, to do it at one center. Uh, but it says if the publication is multi-center, then, and it will have various limitations, you may not publish until there is a multi-center publication. Uh, that's a real problem because the time has to come where you as an institution have an independent right to publish or it does not qualify as research under those IRS rules. So they can't simply stop by saying, you can't publish until the multi-center publication comes out. You must do a carve out. What's the standard carve out? It says, oh, well then X number of months after completion in the classic language, it's in ACTA even, is completion or termination of the study at all sites. Okay, what does that mean? How do you tell if a study has been completed or terminated at all sites? If one study has not turned, and one site has not turned in its study data, is the study complete or not? Does the study become complete at some point when that study, when that center is becomes really stale with its data? If so, when is that? So our problem is that's something that the sponsor has complete control of traditionally up until about 20 years ago where uh, one of the senators, uh, Charles Grassley, started looking at this same issue and in fact pushed through a statute that says in part we're going to define when a study is complete and so they put in the uh, FDA Amendments Act um, a definition of completion and the drug companies ignored it right and in fact NIH did too because it applies to NIH as well and so finally, uh, the government, that is FDA, NIH, and otherwise, got around, the clinicaltrials.gov people got around to uh, uh, defining completion for regulatory purposes. And so we actually have a, a statutory and now regulatory definition of when a study is complete at all sites. 
So as opposed to leaving it open for discussion, open for interpretation, open for the sponsor's uh, subjective determination as to when that study is complete, you simply add in the language as defined in 42 CFR 11.10 paren A close paren. As you can tell, that's something I have to do every time because uh, it's still something that quite a few drug companies will push back on. However, it's mandatory that they, that is the sponsor, that is the drug company for our clinical trials here, they must publish results by one year after the defined completion date. So once they publish the results, there's no reason for your publication, your independent publication rights to be delayed much longer. So my clients generally uh, have a policy that says no more than 18 months after the completion date, they must have an independent publication right. I have a few clients that will go 24, and in rare cases, we'll negotiate the, the internal exceptions that are in the regulations about when it might be extended beyond the defined completion date. But that's something that if every site simply started dropping in that definitional requirement, whether it's in the, uh, the active template or the MAGI template or in what you get from the drug company, uh, we will get this standardized. There was just, oh, I'm going to tell you it's less than six months ago, there was just another study saying that the drug companies are not yet complying with this requirement. They are not routinely putting the results out as required by the statute and the regulation. Uh, for, from, a, from a scientific point of view, from a public policy point of view, and from a uh, uh, move the, the, the advance of medical uh, support point of view, we need to be pushing this as institutions. We need to be getting these results out into the public. Uh, and then uh, science can advance, uh, the medicine and the, and the public health can advance, uh, and uh, the, the rule of law can advance. So this is an area that uh, it may seem a nitpick, but by uh, constantly pushing this must publish by this date, you put yourself in a position, one, where you were in complete compliance with the IRS requirements and you're helping the overall uh, state of the, the scientific endeavor. All right, uh, now we can go to the next slide. Okay, well, don't go two, just one. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, here's where your issues come up that you'll want to look at. If there is patent information and uh, the, the sponsor routinely will say they need an additional period of time for delay in this case, do they in fact have that right? If they do, how long and uh, particularly, do they have the right uh, when they, the patent, is it, is it a set number of days or is it uh, a maximum number of days where if they, because nowadays it's easy to file a provisional patent and make that move. Uh, so these are some things, I can't give you the exact language in this case, it's not like the 42 CFR site where you just drop that exact thing in, but this is an area to look at in terms of that extended delay for when there is patentable information in the uh, information you're providing. Uh, and then again, what, if anything, can you publish in non-scientific journals, so forth and so on. Now, this is particularly important nowadays where uh, it's not so much the journals, newspapers, radio, or TV, it's your website and it's your uh, Twitter account and your um, uh, any of the rest of the social media. So. Uh, take a look at that and also then make sure that your people understand uh, what they can and cannot say on those public in, in those public forums. So next slide now. 
Okay. All right. The indemnification clause, uh, as uh, uh, one of the drug company lawyers that I was on a, on a podium with said, uh, this is the most negotiated and least litigated clause ever. Uh, and, and that's particularly true in research. For the last 40 years, no, 35 years since I've been involved in research activities, I have been asking anyone who can identify a reported court case that the indemnification clause or anything about indemnification is an issue in a research context, please send me a link or a site to that case. I've never gotten one site, not from anywhere. And I've never also been able to find one with my own research in, uh, in Lexis and before we use Lexis Westlaw. Uh, I would love to have a case related to indemnification I haven't found one. My co-instructors on the research law seminar we do uh, for SRA have never identified one. So we really would like to have it. That being said again, uh, it's a very, very detailed clause. Uh, I, I note again in that uh, seminar, that day long seminar we do, uh, there is a, a 90 page law review article that we cite routinely about indemnification uh, just in the state of Pennsylvania, and it's 90 pages of material, 45 pages of text and 45 pages of footnotes. So it is just incredible how detailed this clause and negotiation about this clause could be. So the first question, of course, is who is indemnifying and who's indemnified? This is particularly important when you have a CRO involved because the CRO doesn't want to indemnify anybody. And if they do, it's very minimal. Uh, they, the sponsor in those cases will need to be directly involved with a, usually with a separate letter of indemnification. Um, and, and again, then that letter of indemnification is a separate agreement between you as an institution and that uh, sponsor, which is why it's not normally included within the uh, context of the CTA. I have recently seen situations where the CRO has been granted a letter of authorization to, to agree to indemnification on behalf of the sponsor. And so that's an area you're going to need to do your due diligence on uh, when you look at a, a clinical trial agreement. Who can indemnify, who's indemnified, and how's it being done? Particularly, again, what if it's a three-party agreement? To what extent is that investigator or the investigator's employer involved in indemnifying and for what, all right? And, and again, then that's the next part. What is the scope of the indemnification? If you, now, it's important to understand indemnification deals with third party claims. So these are not claims related to breach of contract by one party against the other contract party. They're third party claims against the party that was not at fault, or at least was not completely at fault. So the first issue is uh, usually you as an institution, if you can indemnify at all, and we'll come back to that, uh, will only be indemnifying for things that were caused by your either negligence or a lot of times uh, the institutional policy will say gross negligence uh, or misconduct. Uh, so these would be third-party claims that came about because you dropped the patient off the gurney uh, and, and the sponsor shouldn't be responsible for that. If you are a state institution, you almost certainly have significant limitations on what you can, in fact, indemnify for at all. This is normally by state law, and, you, and all I can say is you're going to have to find out what your state law is about whether or not your institution can indemnify at all, and if so, how much, and if so, are there limits based on whether or not there's appropriated funds, and so forth and so on. It goes all over the place, and it goes all over the place even within a state. Uh, University of Maryland, the University of Maryland, the main campus at College Station, not at College Station, at College Park, is a sue and be sued institution and theoretically could indemnify uh, if their policy so provides. 
but the other Maryland campuses are all considered state agencies and are governed by the state requirements or limitations on indemnification. And that's just Maryland. And so every state is different. Uh, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Texas, all states that I have some experience with all have totally different laws about this. Um, okay. Uh, what costs and expenses uh, are, are going to be involved? What kinds of claims? Are the claims only if there's a lawsuit? Are the claims that don't involve a lawsuit and so forth? All right. Uh, also, then within this, uh, one of the things that I always drop in, and it's it is routine in other areas of commerce and industry, but it's not in clinical trials. Uh, the clinical trial agreement uh, sponsor indemnification usually will say from suits by third parties for personal injury. All right. And they're talking about uh, uh, the actual injury of the subject. However, there's two other kinds of third party claims that should be indemnified. The first of those is claims by third parties that the drug company is, has violated someone's intellectual property. So again, it's the drug company protocol, it's the drug company drug, it's the drug company patents, the drug companies are gonna get the patents, so they should be responsible if some third party makes a claim against your institution that you in doing their work are violating someone's patent or other intellectual property. The second kind of violation is for private data. Again, where is it otherwise in the contract, if not in the indemnification, that the sponsor will be uh, responsible if they or their staff violates someone's privacy, if someone's privacy rights. So if, again, their staff member goes out and publishes Kim's uh, medical records uh, on, uh, Instagram or Twitter or something like that, you're going to be held liable under HIPAA requirements. And the Office of Civil Rights, the HHS folks are going to be coming in and giving you a huge fine. How do you transfer that responsibility to the sponsor? Uh, you don't unless it's somewhere in your contract and the place to put it is in the indemnification clause. So you want to add in that the sponsor will indemnify you not only for those personal injuries related to the subject, but also for violations or infringements of intellectual property and privacy, third party privacy rights. All right? uh, and then uh, an area that uh, this is one to kick to your counsel, all right? uh, because it is incredibly complex, but state by state, Negligence law provides two different ways to deal with what happens when two parties are involved in negligence. The traditional so-called contributory negligence principle said, if you were contributed at all, right, all bets were off. Right? Your negligence negated the other party's obligations. However, many, many, many states have changed that more or less to lead to more or less proportional negligence. So that, and Florida is one of the best examples of this. In Florida, you can be 50% liable, 45% liable, 10% liable, and the other party is liable for the rest. Or, or maybe multiple other parties are liable for the rest. Or maybe a party is not liable at all because you as the actor, the person who said, hey, I was injured, you were contributorily negligent. So how does this work in the indemnification uh, situation? It's one, again, talk it over with your counsel, decide, do you need to add in language about in whole or in part? Uh, that's a classic kind of legal phrasing that you might use. Is there other language you need to use because of your state statutes on proportional or participatory negligence? All right. Uh, and then uh, are you going to take this beyond the subject's injuries? And this is important, particularly if you start dealing with items that ha could have environmental effects uh, or could go beyond the individual subject and their injury. 
so two areas that you might consider this, particularly when you start dealing with um, uh, drugs that are applied to the skin or otherwise that then could, that could go into further contact with others. The classic example of this is, is uh, skin applied uh, hormones, uh, which then can be rubbed off on other people. Uh, the other thing that you may come up with, and this is a non-medical per se, but it it's, uh, could be an issue. What about things like family therapy and therapy and, and uh, 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 psychological treatments in particular and their effects on other members of the family, a parent and child, uh, husband and wife, or wife and wife or husband and husband, whatever partners involved there. Um, is there uh, any responsibility for uh, long-term effects or for expanded effects to others? All right, next slide. Michael, I just want to do a quick time check. We're yeah, over I, I see we're out of town, so let's jump real quick. I think we're about, about done, almost. Okay, uh, and we've talked about all of this, so let's go on. Okay, and uh, again, what's the carve out then? That's, I'll just leave it at that. That's the very straightforward part there. And then let's jump to the next slide. Okay, and again, how do you deal with indemnification claims as they come up? These are, there's, this is where you need to talk with your institution and we'll go on to the next slide. Okay, and then again, we've talked about this, so let's jump on. Okay, uh, and uh, insurance, uh, uh, just let me point out again that many clinical trial agreements require the institution to have insurance, but don't have a mutual obligation. There should be a mutual obligation here, and we'll go to the next slide. All right. Uh, real quickly then, dispute resolution, your institution will have policies and procedures about this, particularly if you are a state institution, you need to know those uh, policies and procedures uh, and particularly looking for uh, your jurisdiction. You can always go to silence and that is normally the direction to go to. But uh, one of my clients was automatically going to silence. I said, no, first push back. You got to make changes otherwise. First push back and say you want your own state. And then when they say they don't want that, then go to silence. So it's a two-step process uh, in this case. Uh, let's go to the next one. And there's uh, additional information. Uh, I did check these sites so they are current as of about a month and a half ago but they keep changing them on me so you may you may find you get a 404 with some of them uh and then uh, i think we're at the very end and it's past time for questions i'm sorry go ahead so i i can hang around i don't know if the room can stay open or not jeff we have a little bit of time here before the next presentation so um if there are any questions feel free to enter them into the chat and see how many we can get through. Everybody's stunned. <laughs> They're digesting. They're digesting uh, that great information. You're welcome to the person who said thank you. I'm to, uh, I'm, uh, as I'm saying, I, I'm sorry, I didn't quite get that timing down. I needed to tighten it up just a little bit on identification. So. No, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I know I'm going to be looking back at those slides in the future as a reference. Yes. And, and uh, Jeff, I understand everybody can get a copy of the slides. Yes. Right? And Absolutely. you're also, my information is, contact information is there. I'm also on the research administrator's mailing list. Feel free to uh, email me or uh, throw a comment on. I'm not as good about looking at the mailing list as I should be, but uh, it's there. And all the clocks are going off again. <laughs> so. Well, thank you again. And, and everyone's uh, sharing their thanks in the chat here right now. And I think a lot of people are going to look back at this recording and the slides that you have prepared. Right. And, and as I say, feel free to ask further questions. And as I say, and obviously, I am not providing legal advice by this. This is purely for training purposes. So now you've got my disclaimer there, too. Well, thank you so much.
I hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon. And, and we'll see everybody tomorrow if they want to come. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you.